Hi. So, hi, I'm Leonard Trammell, and for some strange reason, some people think that I might have something interesting to say. Especially about this vintage computer and the, uh, and the age of, uh, of Commodore. So you got any questions for me? Or? And so 35 years ago, you were in graduate school. 35 years ago, I was in graduate school, and this uh, interesting idea, the Commodore 64, was uh, just coming to fruition. The, uh, I was involved a little bit in the design of, the, uh, of its predecessor, the VIC-20, and the guys that did that knew at the time that they wanted to make a machine that was much more powerful than a VIC-20. Um, so they did, and the Commodore 64 came out at a pretty amazingly high price at the time of just $595, $600, and in, uh, in an amazingly small number of months, the rate at which those machines were selling was just, just ridiculous. Uh, I think the machine eventually got to the point where they were going at something like a million per month, which is pretty, pretty remarkable at the peak and uh, so I was as you said in graduate school in New York and the uh, lots of different stores were uh, were carrying the machine and I would occasionally uh, go down and visit and see what sort of stuff was uh, was available uh, a, a fun little tidbit um, there was this other guy that would keep sh that would show up occasionally when I was there and he looked vaguely familiar um, it was David McCallum the actor that played Ilya Kuryakin. Uh, so uh, apparently he was a Commodore 64 uh, fan. I did not know that after yeah. all these years. And of course yeah. he's on NCIS. And now he's in, on NCIS. Which, and I love the show, uh -huh. and not just because of that. Uh -huh. But that but that does help. So that was, uh, that was fun. So you mean if I ever see David McCallum, I'll say, hey, you ought to grab my Commodore 64? <laughs> I don't know how much of a fan he was, oh, okay. but he was in the store oh. relatively frequently. Which store are we talking about? I, I don't remember where it was. It was, in, it was. it was in Manhattan. Oh, in Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. So I would I would go visit there uh, periodically uh, when I was in graduate school at uh, at Columbia. And you recognized him right away for you say, oh, that's good. Oh yeah. That's David oh, absolutely. Wow, interesting. Yeah, but I didn't I didn't introduce myself or or you know, bother him. Well, I have a Hollywood connection to, to tell you when the camera's off. I can't even see it on a camera. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be top secret. Okay. 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 Uh, I, I don't think David McCallum was counting on too much top secret uh, privacy in a in a hobbyist store in New York. But yeah, it, the, uh, the machine really caught on. It was... Uh, so I had... Um, I had a pet in my lab at uh, Columbia. Okay. Uh, was using it to do data collection and, and the like. Okay. And um, by the time I was done with graduate school, the Commodore 64 was a requirement um, for several of the engineering schools. So every student had to have a Commodore 64. In the engineering school? In the engineering school. Wait, so we're talking about graduate programs, or um, I think graduate? I think it was mostly graduate programs, but it was it was engineering. So like the the uh, the School of Mines. Okay. Yes. Um, a lot of the students had um, a Commodore 64 because it was just an easy way to do electronics and uh -huh, and uh -huh. lots of uh, uh, very easy ways to hook up to uh, various pieces of equipment. That's which like was when, that's like when I hear stories of you know the military used the Commodore 64, you know. For or, or databases, or uh, yeah, yeah I wouldn't like that wouldn't be surprised. Oh, wow. Yeah, and this is always you know interesting, fascinating for me to hear you know other uses of the Commodore. Yeah, um, so my my background is in in physics and astronomy, so every once in a while, um, it of course doesn't happen anymore, but I would see Commodore pets in strange and wonderful places. So there was a Commodore pet being used. Um, at Lick Observatory to handle a particular part of the uh, of the um, control mechanisms for the uh, the, the big 120 inch uh, telescope up there and I was at the um, at CERN 
okay. uh, long before the Large Hadron Collider existed. Um, and they had a, a big uh, detector called the, uh, the Large European Bubble Chamber. And oh, this was, okay. it was a, a radiation, a, a, a particle detector. Oh, okay. Was it a big bubble? Um, no, it was a big, um, big vat of liquid hydrogen. Uh -huh. Okay. And when the um, when uh, charged particles would go through, it would leave a trail of bubbles, and they would be able to track things that way. And there was this wall of electronics that controlled it. And in the center of it, there was a Commodore PET. <laughs> and this was in the 1980. This was in 1984 that I saw it. And what happens is you'll get this machine that is used as part of the system. And then as people expand and grow and develop new stuff, they don't get rid of the old stuff because it works. Uh, right. So we wind up with these things lasting for a very long time, very good. which is lots of fun. And then when they do get rid of it, hopefully it'll be labeled with you know the organization it came from. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> um, I believe that um, some people at Commodore found out about the pet that was being used at Lake Observatory. Okay. So they gave them an Amiga to, um, uh, to to modernize. And of course, Amiga isn't really, when I think of Amiga, I don't think of Commodore for obvious reasons. Uh, but I, uh, but that's okay. Not everyone has my personal biases. <laughs> well, you are biased in the correct way. Oh. In a justifiable way. It's uh, it's very funny to to look at the the his the history of machines from Commodore and Atari, because the people that made the Commodore machines went to Atari, and the people that made the Atari machines went to Commodore. <laughs> huh. So in 1984, the the sort of the design philosophy of the two groups swapped, huh. literally, because the people swapped. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. So if you look at the Atari 800. Okay. Um, and its set of machines, and you look at the Amiga, both of those machines were very much tied to NTSC graphics. Uh, yes. And they work very well, you no know, color bleed, all of that stuff. Because it's the same people. Right. Different companies. One was Atari, one was Commodore. Uh -huh. But they're the same people involved. <laughs> and then you have the, um, the more a uh, simple compute-oriented design of the PET okay. and the Commodore 64 being mimicked in the ST. So again, uh, graph... I never thought of that. Yeah. So the ST gets... So the philosophy behind the ST... It's very, very much like... It's very, very Commodore-ish. Oh, wow. I never thought of So that. if you look at the, at the, um, at the CPU speed uh -huh. for an Amiga, it's 7.18 or something megahertz, and it's and it's that number to make it mesh well with NTSC graphics. Same with the Atari 800, the Commodore 64 or the PET were exactly one megahertz, because they didn't care so much about the graphics as as the computation. So the ST was 16 megahertz, exactly. Okay. Not tuned to. Uh, uh, it was a little, so it, it did have to worry about NTSC graphics, but it wasn't the, the primary uh, motivation. So just little little wrinkles like that are fun. See these little details, I don't know anything about. Them. <laughs> and of course, Brian Bagnall is writing his new book about Commodore in the late years. Uh huh. And after after your father left the company. Right. So so he says, oh, I have like a thousand pages, twelve hundred pages to write up. He's gonna tell the history of everything all the way up to uh, the bankruptcy in 1994. Okay, good for him. So, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if his information is gonna, you know, give us even more details, more trivia. Well, there's details, there's trivia, and then there's actual facts. <laughs> you mean, wait, a minute. you mean they're not all the same? Unfortunately not. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, I thought they were so, all the same. So I, I had a discussion um, online the, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, some, I was in a group that discusses the Atari Jaguar. Okay. And uh, someone mentioned a machine that never came out called the Panther. 
and there was a, uh, a, a YouTube video about the Panther and a couple of articles that had been written and everything was wrong. Oh, wow. I just, Wait, did you get to that YouTube channel and said, everything is wrong here. You are crazy guys. No, I didn't. Oh, you didn't? Well, no, I didn't. I, I didn't. Um, the, the guy that posted the link I, uh, to this uh, private group, I said, that's it. I said, wow, almost every fact in here is wrong. So and you, it's, didn't, you didn't make any correction anywhere? Or? Well, it's people people eventually asked, and, oh, okay. and I told them. But oh, okay, very good. But it, it's it, uh, okay. I have I have not read Bagnell's book. I don't know how accurate it was. Um, I, I have read other books uh, on about that time period, and uh, details and facts are not always the same thing. It's disappointing, and I'm sure none of it is deliberately untrue. Which people got information that turned out to not be correct, and they went with it. Oh well. Uh, I should be more careful. Uh, <laughs> or you could you you have my email. You can just ask me. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. You're very welcome. This little talk here, and I'm sure the people at the Pacific Commodore Expo and the Commodore <laughs> Vegas Expo would really be happy to hear your hi guys. <laughs> Alrighty, you take care.